Dr. Sanjoni is going to start off this section right now. We're going to talk to you about the clinical trials. Uh, and we're we privileged we have a couple of guests who are going to talk to us about ongoing trials. But first, we'll talk about what's happened so far. No good news, as you know, but at least we'll give you the details of what trials have been done and why they thought someone thought they might be useful. Thank you. Okay. Um, I know this is something that you all are always interested interested in. Um, well, let's leave it here. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of what um, well we know what MSA is. Now the neuropathology is this accumulation of this protein that's called alpha synuclein. Um, and this protein accumulates everywhere and what is bad is starts with a very a pretty s simple molecule, one molecule, and then aggregates and it's a very social protein and so then expands and becomes a big group and then precipitate uh, into the, the cells and cause trouble. That's in a nutshell, okay? And that's what we're targeting. Well, this is just an image. Um, now, what this does is, you can't really see this, downstream creates a lot of inflammation and also damage the cells in which it accumulates. So the, the cells cannot function properly. Um, a lot of these more recent trials stemmed from work uh, that was done on an animal model by Dr. Maslier. Now, um, we always generally tr like to have an animal model so you, we can play with things. The problem is, of mice and men, we are not mice. So sometimes things work in mice and th they don't work in men. Um, at any event, this was a model that they created and was great. We loved it. We finally had a, an animal model to work with. And then they start to play with medications. Some of you this morning were asking, why don't we try new things? Frankly, again, I think every drug in the book has been tried on these mice to see if any drug um, was effective. And they identified one drug that seems to work, it was refamping. And without being too boring and going through all the images and all those slides, but basically, you see there is one big bar and there is one lower bar. Okay, the, bar, the lower bar was, was with the animal model that was treated with the medication, so we said, great, then refamping works. They found two drugs that seem to be effective. One is paroxetine, which is many of you may be on just for depression. It's called Paxil, the commercial brand, okay? And the other one is rifampin, which is a very old drug used to treat uh, um, TB, okay? Some other drugs works as blocking uh, inflammation, which is a downstream effect of this accumulation. And so those two directions were the one in which a lot of trials have gone in in recent years. So one study was done by Dr. Novak with intravenous immunoglobulin. And again, these are all scores that we use to rate the motor performance and whatever, and to make a long story short, was disappointing, it doesn't work. So despite the anti-inflammatory um, process, despite the potential benefit things, uh, some numbers look good showing some improvement, but not from a clinical standpoint. So, um, so we had to abandon that idea. So uh, the other drugs that we talked about, again, was the refamping, because it was the idea that was blocking this accumulation, actually the aggregation of this alpha-synuclein, uh, and thus preventing downstream damage. So study was done. These are all the detail multiple center, um, recruited patient, and there was a deal to do an interim, although it was a double blind uh, trial, we wanted to do an interim analysis to see if there was a futility or, you know, sometimes we try drug, uh, and at some point we may realize that the pa there is a group that seems to do very poorly, and maybe the group that's actually on the active medication, not the placebo, so there is always an interim time where you do an analysis, usually done by not the primary investigator, but 
a regulatory board to determine that A, the study is not futile, or B, you are not actually doing harm instead of uh, um, improving the situation. And to make a long story short, didn't work. So, and we sliced the data in any possible way we could. Uh, AMSAR sees a score that looks mainly at motor performance. Uh, and then we looked also at uh, the um, autonomic studies, see if by, by any chance there was an improvement maybe in a certain uh, subset of clinical manifestation. And the answer is a disappointing no. So uh, unfortunately, working mice does not work in men. So let me skip uh, all these. Again, if you see the bars, they are not exactly as exciting as the bar that you saw before in, uh, when we added the mice. Here the two bars are identical. So treated and untreated patient results are identical. So, um, and this is not a super benign drug. I mean, it can cause liver toxicity, can cause other things. So, um, but obviously if it worked, we were most happy to, to deal with those side effects, but unfortunately that wasn't the case. So, and again, we looked also at the uh, subset of autonomic data to see if there was any uh, benefit and that I wasn't done. So, bottom line, the study was disappointingly and unquestionably negative. Again, was terminated early uh, because the interim analysis sh showed no difference. Um, still, we, uh, you know, we want to continue to look for other options, but right now, again, that, um, direction is a dead end. Now, there is a new trial going. Some of you have were asking about stem cells. So this is a trial that's ongoing now, and these are the uh, people that are in involved in this. So um, basically what they're, they're doing, they're taking your own uh, stem cell, um, they take a piece of fat, and they develop the cells, they grow it in culture, to develop them into cells that can then evolve into any other, in theory, um, cells or organ. And then they inject that into, directly into the uh, spinal fluid. Now, where does this idea come from? Well, you have heard about stem cells in Parkinson's disease, and I'm sure you heard about stem cells in a variety of other conditions. Um, we are way behind with the MSA. Part of a challenge is that, for the reason we said before, you involve multiple systems. So it's not that we just have to say, okay, let's say your liver doesn't work. Okay, I'm gonna go and chase your liver. No, we have multiple levels, multiple areas of the brain, areas of the spinal cord, areas lower in the cord that are affected. So much more complex idea, but this is the study. And the original idea came from a study done in Korea where they had an open label, a 29 patient of MSA, and they infused actually uh, directly into the vessels, which we thought was quite brave because we were concerned and with that they could cause a stroke. But they did it. Um, and uh, seemingly um, they had some signs of improvement in the treated group. So. The, this is the very first uh, um, experience that we have. Um, and uh, um, again, uh, the findings are not exactly stellar, but there was uh, some indication that this could be promising. However, our folks felt that we could do better. First of all, this was, a, again, was a single center, was done only in the uh, cerebellar subtype, which is the least common form of MSA, uh, being injected through uh, basically into the vascular system, they weren't sure that there was a good um, uh, penetration in the brain because they could not cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, and they saw, again, this uh, improvement to be only transient, which is something that whenever you do an intervention is always a concern because you always, uh, whenever you you perform any kind of intervention, there is a benefit indirectly because of your own body reaction, which could be also uh, enthusiasm, if you want to put it that way, that creates a good discharge of good neurotransmitters, they may create a, a transient improvement. 
So we want to go the next level. So the, the, uh, the Mayo Group has decided to pick this time, not patients just with MSA-C, but all kinds of MSA. They want to take them at very early. Um, and uh, they decide to infuse directly into uh, the, the spinal fluid, so an intrathecal infusion. Um, and they try to be very selective, I would say almost obsessive, uh, in terms of the patient they select to involve in the trial. And the idea is to see if this is safe, is it tolerated, and then does it work? Um, and then there are, a, and then they want to do a dose also uh, efficacy curve. So how many cells do you need to inject and in, in, in see something? So it's a pretty involved study. Um, and basically, the first step is identify the patient, get the sample of their their tissue and grow the cells and then inject them. And so all this is done in vitro. So we just did the first patient May 1st. So, um, and right now five patients have received the injection. So far, knocking on wood, no side effects, no adverse event, no nothing, but again, N of five, so too early to say, can't say anything obviously about efficacy, so stay tuned. Now, somebody was asking this morning also about the news that came out about a week ago or so uh, of a researcher that are growing a mini brain. Now, careful with that definition. Um, that means these cells, you can train them. These are cells that are like our original embryogenic cells, and they may develop into just about any kind of cells with the proper signal. But from there to function properly and to create the proper connection, it's a long, long shot. So yes, we are encouraged that we see that this is an opportunity, but it is nowhere close to be ready for everyday use. And again, we don't know yet if it works. Um, and I'll stop here.